what are you doing? I am right now uh, looking for contracts because I'm a game design consultant and I'm going around to see if anybody needs any help. The shakedown, hustle stuff. That's right. You know, schmooze, shake hands, say, what can I do for you? Remind people you exist. That's right. That's why the hat's here. Everybody can find me when I'm wearing the hat. The hat is truly key to understanding the Ernest Adams concept. And how's the Ernest Adams concept going over 2002? Um, I hope it's going to be good. We're finishing up our book on game design, uh, patterns in game design. I'm working on that with Andrew Rawlings. That should come out sometime in 2002. What's your thesis that you're warmed up to? Ooh, you're going to have to give me a minute to think about that one. Um, the thesis that I'm warmed up to in my game design book, probably the central thing is the player experience. It is not the content. It is not the um, graphics or um, all the uh, whiz-bang technology. It is what the player does. You always start by asking, what is the player going to do with his eyes and what's he going to do with his hands? Mm. And you work from there outwards. Mm. And do you see more and more designers respecting that as the game industry develops, or are there more and more formula experiences that uh, shudder the player? Um, no, I think uh, you know. I think people are sort of working in those ways. Uh, Res is a good example of thinking of something really new to do that turns a game into a musical instrument. For example, you know, you can turn off the game part of Res and just play it as a musical instrument, and that's that's um, honing in on the the essence of the experience. You know, it's 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 what the player is doing. Of course, what they're seeing and hearing in Res is really interesting too. But they started with what they're doing. <laughs> What's your name? Michael Williams. <laughs> and what what do you do? What's your thing? Uh, uh, I am I am a computer game developer out of Irvine, California. And what's your studio called? Uh, it's called Code Fire. It's a it's a brand new studio. It's about a year and a couple months old, and we're developing a uh, uh, a game for Microsoft right now and Sega and THQ. And then uh, before that, I've been in the game industry for probably 15 years. So what's what change do you see? I mean, coming to GDC 2002, standing here on the floor. I mean, what do you see crazy stuff happening that's never happened before? I mean, a lot of movement towards massively multiplayer games, uh, which is really cool. Um, a lot of some some you know a lot more women getting involved in the industry, both as consumers and as uh, developers, which is you know good. Um, so. Um, and I think I think the most exciting thing is massively multiplayer and, and more consumer-oriented product. You play massively multiplayer games? Absolutely. Uh, big fan of Asheron's Call. You have the time? Uh, no. <laughs> no. So how do you how do you play then if you don't have the time? <laughs> well, I play because it's my job to play. So I get paid to play. Yeah, all that. All, you know, it's just like uh, my mom always said. You know, you should stop playing those games because you're going to need a career someday. And I'm like, well, what if the games were my career? And I think I've uh, proven that point. Well, now. congratulations. Thank, Thank you, very you very much. much. <laughs> In 10 years of talking to your fans and stuff, have you seen a general direction in the industry or the people who play your games that's changed or that's pushing you to grow in new ways? Well, the majority of people who still play games are white males like you and I, you know, uh, 18 to 35 years old. But I was at, uh, I was at my hairstylist a couple weeks ago, you know, because you got to get the do on, right? And I was paying for my haircut, and there were these two women who came up to me. Well, they didn't really come up to me, but they were at the counter. And they're talking about playing, like, Rayman and The Sims and all these games. Like, like 40-year-old housewives. And I'm sitting here, and my, I was blown away, and I had to stop. And I'm like, you know, I just have to say, I've never seen this before, and I think it's really fascinating. And they're like, yeah, our kids play the games, and we totally wind up getting into them. So you're seeing a lot of women start play, starting to play games. Everybody's asking, you know, are games mainstream? Are games mainstream? Hell yeah. Everybody plays games, you know? I mean, we all play games. You know, your mom plays games. Even though we all may not admit it, because everybody still has, it's there's still like a, a geek stigma attached to it. We all play games. Does your wife play games? A little bit here and there. She likes Parappa the Rapper and uh, Buster Groove and Space Channel 5, those kinds of music games. So she balances you out a little bit, like in her tastes, maybe. Look, I, I don't play games when I go home. You know, if, if you ever came to my house and saw the gaming setup I have, there's basically nothing there. I'm like a plumber who has leaky pipes at home. My computer at home is like a piece of crap, Pentium 400 with like a 15-inch monitor. The last thing I want to see when I come home at the end of the day is another damn computer or video game. What do you like to do to unwind, then, if not play games? Wife and I watch TV and movies and hang out, play board games, go for walks, play with the dog, simple stuff, you know? That's good. Where do you live? What state? Raleigh, North Carolina. All right. What drew you to study games? I don't think that the women in the industry have enough, uh, there are enough of them yet to really have an influence on the kind of games that are made. To have that happen, there needs to be a change in the perception of the market. Mm. So the, the developers and publishers have to believe that they can sell the games to women. So The Sims, actually, I think, has some potential to, to change that because it's clear that women are starting, 
that the women do play games, but as long as the industry sells primarily to the hardcore gamer, that's still a pretty masculine market. So I don't think that it, it's kind of a double bind. You know, you you aren't going to make those games until you have the audience, but until you have the audience, you're not going to have as much interest to get people into the industry, and it's very circular. So what are you making? Well, I'm going to write a book. It's my postdoctoral project. I already have a PhD, but I'm interested in how organizations work, particularly um, to construct a sense of community and identity. And so I'm interested in how women who come into the industry are confronted with this very masculine culture that they either have to adapt to or try to change. And I'm interested in what happens in that process. Can you give us, I don't know, a telling, a specific example that's got you fired up at the moment? Well, actually, I can. It, in um, in the expo in the, on the Metro Works booth, they have an ad for to come work for us, and it's a very busty woman wearing a, a scanty costume, saying, you know, I'm I'm the dominant type. Come and work for me. And just why would a woman want to apply for that job? And it, there's so many examples like that. I mean, in game developer, I tear out advertisements all the time saying there is no way that a woman is going to feel good about applying for this position. So that kind of that's what I mean by the construction of a masculine culture, that until that starts to change, you're not going to get as many women. You're only going to get women who are really want to be in gaming, not some who are, well, I'd like to do some kind of work in this area, but I have uh, not, I'm not committed to gaming. And I guess they use those advertisements because they think young guys are horny and they're going to like big, busty, computer-generated chicks. Probably. And it's certainly that that's how they make the games, too. But again it's circular you know you make the games the guys play then the guys come and work for the industry and make more of those games yeah. so you're going to have to break out of the mold and that's why i think the sims is interesting because the sims starts to break out of that mold great thank you so much hello don hello justin who are you uh let's see i'm a user interface flower child uh, i'm a migrant uh i make up euphemisms for things we're not supposed to talk about so um <laughs> okay okay <laughs> that's good so what's what are you excited about um, let's see. I'm excited about Edible Sims. Edible Sims. We're going to make the next version of The Sims. You're going to be able to take your Sims and print them out as three-dimensional pieces of food that the how they taste depends on their personality. So, so if you like have a really bad Sim that goes around and They'll be like all chewy and stringy and everything. Or they'll be like pork fat, right, delicious right, but right. evil. So if you've raised some, right, if you feed them a lot and, and give them a good exercise, well, we're talking with the Slim Jim company, you know, they're gonna, <laughs> and we're gonna have one of those little, um, those breakfast egg things. You know how you cook your eggs in the breakfast? Like, oh, no. Oh. <laughs> well, it's, you crack the eggs into it, and it's the shape of your Sim, and you just get like an omelet in the shape and whatever you want to put inside it is really we're going for the uh, disgusting foods market so well that, that sounds great because then it's like uh, you know educating people about what they consume yeah, what they the put four in their food bodies. group the four food groups oh. exactly so, which are like um, male female young and old right right and uh, light and dark and medium right light and dark we're, and we're aquarius and libra and there we're going to have a whole line of censored food for adults censored food oh, censored right. food yeah with fuzzed out genitals yes well it's not to keep the kids from getting corrupted. It's from keeping the poor little Sims from being embarrassed that people know that they're actually like Barbie dolls. So, and, it, and so the reproduction is entirely machine driven then? Uh, there's actually, if you look, you know, the menu, when you click on the bed, it says um, uh, play, play in bed. Um, if you actually look in the code, it actually says have sex in the code. So they really are having sex in the code. With what? If they're Barbie dolls? Well, there's a lot of definitions of sex. I'll have to talk to you about that off camera. Well, unless so. I can get the code and see what the definitions are of sex in the code. Right, but it is sex with a capital S, definitely. It is, there's no doubt that they really are having and, sex. And how many X's? Oh, just one. Just, just one. one. Right, yeah. just one. Okay. Yeah, so who are you? Me? Yeah. Um, God. Today? Yes, today. Today. Today, I am Julius Caesar. Oh, and, and Julius Caesar is a, a conqueror, a, a person returning back to their conquered land, uh, a, a wizened king surveying uh, lands in, 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 dis, in turmoil. Uh, what, what is Julius Caesar today? No, he's the little guy that lives in my nose. He comes out and jumps in my hand and dances. <laughs> he does. Okay. Yeah. Huh. All right. That's good. And when, when he dances about people pay to watch? No, I put him in this box. Oh, well then, it's good that you carry with both hands. Yeah, I can't let him out. Yeah, that's good. Okay.
He behaves very badly. <laughs> and um, but when he behaves badly, that's provocative. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So provocative is good. He's my little friend. Yeah. You know, is The Sims this universe you've created that's going to allow you to continue exploring, or have you designed meta universes that encompass The Sims already, or which direction you had? Micro, macro, where are you headed? Do you think? Well, right now I'm heading to online multiplayer, you know, which is oh. social, real people, hmm. no AI, um, and it's all about community structures. You know, starting at the household level, person to person, growing up to a whole city. And you don't see, I mean, do you see other people who are your peers in that area, or do you feel like you're mostly working, uh, you're, you're mostly charting ground that you have to chart alone? Well, there are a lot of online games out there, and so we have to learn a lot from what's been done. Um, we have to basically use their games as our prototypes. Hmm. Um, you can't tune or test a game like this inside a small company because you need thousands of people playing it. Hmm. So um, it's a very different kind of uh, development risk, the way you have to go about it. I mean, you'll, you'll appear to appeal to an entirely different market and then get all those people playing actively online. It could create an emotional force. I mean, that's what some of these other online games have done. Yeah, I think it will. I mean, in fact, I'm a little worried that it might be too strong. You know, I see these people that are having their marriages broken up by EverQuest and stuff. And, you know, I want to design a game that doesn't drive that level of obsession. I'd rather have kind of a more playful, fun place to be where creativity is rewarded. And it's a nice place to go visit for several hours every weekend. Um, Rather than something that you know you feel like you have to be on every night for four hours, or right, you, or else you're, you're, you're right. Yes, that's right. No treadmill. Mm. Yeah. Give us a, a sketch of what you see as some of the undiscovered territory in wireless gaming that you're playing with. Okay. Well, it, when you look at uh, wireless devices, in many ways uh, they're vastly inferior in terms of displaying media than almost any other existing gaming platform. Tiny little screen, mostly black and white, uh, no or very bad audio support. But on the other hand, unlike, uh, say, the original home computers, they're networked from the inception. So from my perspective, they offer the opportunity to create games of a style unlike any we have seen before that are media rich, media poor, but communication rich, in which uh, multiplayer and communication among the players is, is vital to gameplay. There's some, uh, some science fiction I've read says that uh, when humans reach a certain point in evolution where we've uh, manufactured machines that can well enough maintain the, the drudgery of our society, we will then be elevated to people who make art and, and play games. Do you uh, see that happening faster and faster with the sale of personal computers and high-tech uh, entertainment devices? Um, well, I, I don't know. Americans work more hours now than they did 10 years ago. I think almost the, re the reverse is true. Somehow we managed to create more work for ourselves. I don't necessarily view that as a negative. To, in, to, in some ways, work is the most satisfying thing uh, a person can do if it's work that they're interested and engaged with. Um, hopefully, the advent of computers alleviate a lot of the drudgery, the drudge work uh, that otherwise uh, people in previous eras were subject to. But I don't think we're all going to turn into a leisure society either. Well, but maybe people are spending more time at work because they are chatting. So it'll be interesting to see if they are playing games on their mobile phones, taking bathroom breaks, that sort of thing will be amplified by the online community that's in their pocket. Uh, that, that's potentially true. Yeah, of course, it's kind of hard for me to judge how much time I'm actually spending wasting because I can always justify playing games as work. <laughs> so. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. <laughs>bit about what you're working on now in the games industry? Um, well, I'm actually in academia, mm -hmm. so I'm working in two particular areas. One is uh, at UC Irvine where I'm teaching now. We're developing an undergraduate game program, slowly but surely. Um, right now it's just in the form of some loosely related courses in fine art and also computer science. So kids who want to do game design can go to this cluster of classes, and eventually we're hoping to ramp that up to a minor, full-fledged minor. Right now it's part of the digital arts minor. 
So when you say uh, learning game design undergraduate, uh, both computer graphics and art, I mean, and design. Do you have classes where you teach game design yeah. fundamentals? And yeah, so we have, uh, for example, my colleague Robert Nidefer is teaching a class on uh, game and cult games and culture. Um, I've taught a class on imaginary world design and another one on a uh, game design workshop that where the kids have to have 10 weeks to design a game and, and rapidly prototype a, a working demo um, using just some really simple 3D system. They don't have to do any programming. It's really, really simple stuff. Um, eventually want to bring in some more technical oriented classes, but we're really, I mean, part, partly, partially because we're coming out of an art department that's very conceptually oriented, we're tending to lean towards design, graphics, play, you know, play mechanics. Uh, the Imaginary Worlds class was non-media specific, so it was books, movies, games, whatever, and the idea was that you would just explore what are the elements you need to invent, you know, a completely made up fictional world. And when you say you're moving towards that, you're moving away from then technology and engine development and programming stuff, do you mean? No, I think we'll include all of that, but I think um, one of the things we feel really strongly is that a lot of game programs tend to think that teaching tools is making a game designer, and we're more interested in teaching people how to think about game structure, game logic, narrative. Um, just because you know 3D Studio Max doesn't mean you know how to design a game, or a character for that matter. So I, I have my kids drawing. Like, if they're going to do conceptual design, I want them to draw with a pencil and make a character and, and design an environment and think conceptually about oh one of my one of the groups did a maze how do you design a maze as a game element um, that stuff is very uh, I think lacking in a lot of ideas about game design because we have this funny idea that it's all about learning the software tools and that just isn't true why do you think that uh, Korea is such a act the Koreans are active consumers of American games and video games at large well basically we have it was it goes back to the end of 1990s when the economy went down and all the computer computer companies were getting bankrupt and then somebody started with this thing called basically an internet cafe with a very fast internet lines and blizzard's uh, starcraft hit the market at the same time and the grim economy and all the children they were just it was very cheap it was about less than a dollar per hour. So all the, all the kids, they just went there and stayed overnight playing StarCraft. And it was just at the same, t at the right time, right place. And all these uh, internet cafes start going, like blooming like about 100 cafes in one town and, and all over the country. And all the students, all the kids were like there overnight playing StarCraft. So basically every internet cafe needed 40 um, at least fast computers. Right, and they need at least um, 20 to 40 copies of StarCraft. So basically, it drove the computer market out of the recession, and also it just sold a lot of copies of StarCraft. So it's not an overstatement to say StarCraft got the Korean computer industry out of the funk. So many people were playing the game at the time, and they had, you know, Korean have this tendency to do it to the extreme and it's, it's getting really um, to the limit where they go to the new games but in the end they come back to StarCraft again because they are so used to playing it and there are four game channels 24 hours and they, uh, they uh, like half the time they show StarCraft tournaments and some of the, you know, the most famous baseball star will be eclipsed by the most famous StarCraft player at the time. And I think the best player last year made somewhere around 200 to like $400,000 just playing games. And he wrote books, and winning tournaments. And that's in Korean income standard, it's very high, probably better than most of the baseball players. This is incredible. Do you see that all this game playing being done by all these kids is inspiring these kids to want to make games, to want mm -hmm. to develop games? Right, it's like uh, game developing and game playing is one of the most uh, want to become job in Korea among the Korean kids. And at the moment, the academia is not supporting it as much as they want to because professors are certainly not uh, trained enough to teach them how to make games, and we're trying to catch up. Who are you? 
I'm Henry Jenkins. I'm the director of comparative media studies at MIT. I've been studying computer games for about 12 years. Yeah, uh, you once said to me that it was great because MTV, uh, MIT would pay for your conventions and comic books and video games. No, it's part of the joy of being a scholar that I get to study what I love. You know, that I, I literally have a research account that buys comics and video games and flies me out to hang out with friends like Warren Spector and Will Wright and so forth here at the conference. So after 12 years of studying games, what changes have you seen in the industry? What do you see this year that's particularly different? Well, I think there's a growing recognition in the industry that it isn't just going to be hardware or technology that's going to create a great game. The great game is going to be out of content. It's going to be story. It's going to be gameplay. It's going to be the emotional experience of the player. It's going to be the community build up around the gameplay and I think that that puts it into a space where we can move move forward. The problem with the game industry is it's been so technology driven and constantly changing and transforming its platforms every few years that people can't really learn from previous work and when you can't learn from previous work the medium really can't move forward. So are you making progress then in academia to develop a longer term study of games as work and well, establish a body of literature in gaming? I think, I think there's a growing body of literature. You'll see four or five major books in the next year that have come out of academic game studies. There's an online journal of game studies. We're also working to try to build bridges between the academy and the industry. We spent two days here at GDC in meetings between industry leaders and academic leaders to see what the future of that relationship look like. And we're going to be doing a does the Creative Leaders Boot Camp up at MIT called Head Games this summer with a number of key industry game designers and academics who've been looking at games coming together to share what we've learned and to foster a kind of creative, innovative spirit to give game industry people a chance to think outside of the box and outside of the need to ship product and to just really drill down on the core building blocks of their medium. And do you and these are creative professionals in the game industry, executives making decisions? Yeah, we think there will be a lot of game designers will come to that. We've been doing this in-house at EA for about two years now, just trying to get some brainstorming going about topics like narrative in games or how to build more compelling characters or how to create more emotionally engaging experiences. And do you find that they're excited to get out of their offices and go back to school? I think they love getting, going back to schools. I mean game designers are often the guys sat in the back of the class reading comics so they're challenged to teach but there are people that once you get them turned on they're extraordinarily intelligent, they're very creative and it creates a really dynamic classroom sort of environment to be in talking to the top game designers. Yeah that sounds fantastic. It sounds like a stimulating place to uh, you know to watch or take part uh, are you playing anything or what's the last game you played that blew your mind uh, I would say we've been looking at both res and frequency as games that really both push gameplay in an interesting direction and this whole notion of synesthesia that are being explored by those games I think is an interesting alternative direction for games not at all a storytelling version of what games can be but something that creates an intense emotional experience that engages the whole senses Hi, Greg. Hello. I'm Justin Hall. Uh, so what are you working on right now? I'm uh, uh, chief design officer and co-founder of a company called Wireless Games, which does uh, games for internet-enabled cell phones. And currently have games live on Verizon, Sprint, AT&T. Um, called Unplugged Games? Unplugged yes, Games, yes. yes. Um, I'm also working with a group called the Themis Group, which provides community management services for massively multiplayer online games. And I'm working on two books at the moment, one on wireless game design and one called Understanding Games. What's understanding games? That sounds broad. Uh, it's an attempt to try to create a critical vocabulary for the discussion of games. Uh, in essence, if you go into any bookstore, you'll find any number of books about film, television, music, um, the novel, other media, that look at it from a critical perspective um, and explain it both to uh, practitioners and would-be practitioners of the field as well as to people who are just fans of the medium. Uh, but virtually nothing like that has been written for games, and I think it's very important uh, that this kind of work start, start to appear. Well, it, part of that might be just because games are so new that everything is continually seeming new, and once things begin to seem old, you can then see patterns emerge and develop vocabulary that's based on sort of emergent patterns and themes from the gaming world. Do you see things that are happening now that are less new than things that have come before? I talk to people and they say there are no new genres, for example, or there are new genres. Oh, yeah, basically, whenever I go to E3 each year, they're usually somewhere between three and five products that I think really have something novel and original to contribute, which given that there are probably 2,000 games shown on the floor at E3 is pretty dismal, uh, but it certainly indicates that, yeah, there, there's certainly, I, I think in some ways there is a huge space of uh, potentially interesting games of which we've colonized a few tiny little areas. Um, and unfortunately, because of the nature of the industry itself, 
publishers are less and less willing to fund innovative product uh, because it costs several million dollars to produce an A-level title at this point. Um, so, uh, you know, the answer is yes on both sides. Uh, there's a lot of very imitative material uh, and it may well be getting worse over time, uh, but also there's a lot of opportunity for innovation. So do you see that if you isolate this critical vocabulary and give people the tools to talk about games in a different way that you're going to be helping to sketch out some of those new areas of gaming that haven't been found yet? Well, it, at least to allow people to say, okay, here's something that might be kind of interesting as a game, and it kind of fits the definition of the game here, and I can see where the kind of categories of pleasure, which is Mark LeBlanc's concept, uh, would work in this kind of environment. Uh, so let's try to at least explore this. So y yeah, I, I think maybe there is at least the potential to get people who, I mean, if you look at the way most artists work, most artists begin by imitating uh, something they love. Uh, if you're a comic book artist, you start by drawing Superman. Uh, and then you take some of the tools that you've learned and you combine them in different ways, but you're still basically uh, advancing the art in a uh, incremental fashion. And then ultimately, hopefully, you, you ultimately work uh, with intentionality. You start from the inception of a project by saying, here's what I want to accomplish here, here's what I want to show, and you create a painting or a comic book or a game uh, that's quite novel and quite different. And I think there are very few people in the field who actually kind of fit into that last category. And inevitably, as the form matures, there will be more people. But also, if we can uh, short circuit some of that process by tapping some of the uh, the expertise and ideas about games that people talk about here, but don't you know don't necessarily ever appear in any other medium. Um, I, I think that would be helpful. Okay, uh, wh who are you? I'm Harvey Smith from Ion Storm Austin, and uh, what are you working on? Right now, I'm working on Deus Ex 2, the sequel to Deus Ex. And and is it possible to do something crazy, revolutionary, and uh, game world changing for a sequel? Yeah, absolutely. The first game had all the gameplay we wanted. The second game has like a much more robust physics, lighting, and sound propagation uh, systems. We license Havoc for physics. And until you've seen like an S pipe and a and a corpse roll down the stairs realistically, properly, you haven't seen anything. So it's like a more effective rendition of the ideas that you were trying to put forth in the first one? Absolutely. This is kind of like the version of the game we wanted to do. And uh, all of the things we were adding have gameplay ramifications. You know, the, the, more, ro uh, the more high fidelity lighting, for instance, is not just there for graphic fo polish, but like because we're doing volumetric shadows, think about like if you open a door and it casts a shadow back on the wall, the player can get behind a door and hide in the shadows. So like the guard AI literally like might not see him walking on a patrol route down the hall just because of the shadow of a door that he's that is partially ajar. Okay, so that's I can see that like technology having gameplay ramifications now. Politically, we've moved to a society that's much more security conscious. A security play security consciousness was huge in the first game, right? I mean, just the world being taken over by different security forces and so forth. Do you see the second game having more political connotations now that America's turned on in that way? Well, Sheldon Picotti is our conversation writer. He's one of the most subversive guys that I know. He's totally into Chomsky. He's just like and all this bizarre stuff, his education is way over my head. Um, so, like, I'm certain that our political voice is going to reflect some of the changes in the world. You know, Deus Ex has a bunch of weirdness associated with it anyway. I mean, just because of an art snafu, the World Trade Towers got left out of the skyline in New York in the first game. And uh, it wasn't delivered at all. And then after that, we had the 9-11 incident. So it's, it's kind of a weird game. Once you throw enough uh, fictional conspiracy elements into the same pot and stir them up, weird fictional things just emerge, like history's happening as we're, as we're playing the game, basically. Yeah, that's right, and you kind of, you cover so many permutations of conspiratorial history that it's possible that Deus Ex 2 things might come true someday. But is that a concern as the lead designer that you have to be politically safe or you want to be politically aggressive or provocative? We just do what we want, and uh, so far no one's stopped us yet. We keep waiting for the hammer to come down, but it hasn't yet. Okay, so you gave a talk this morning. Have you been, and you've been around, have you seen or talked to people who are doing things here that have blown your mind or changed the way you want to go back and continue working? Well, anytime Doug Church talks, I go listen to him, and Will Wright is obviously really smart. Um, in a weird way, I feel kind of spoiled because, you know, we work around Warren, and Doug is our tech director, and, you know, we have a very analytical, academic kind of environment anyway, so... Uh, you know, it's it's kind of it's kind of like I, I don't want to break my arm patting us on the back, but we, we you know we work in an environment where uh, people are pretty thoughtful. You know, my roommate here at GDC is Randy Smith, 
who's giving a speech on stealth in games and has worked on three thief games in a row. So, you know, hey, if I want to know about stealth in games, I go talk to Randy and Lulu from the thief team, and I get an earful about stealth in games. You know, yeah, you get an earful about stealth in games while you're waiting for the, the game to get out of the shower, right? So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's great. Okay, thank you. for about 10 years now. This? Making games. Since I was 17 years old, uh, this summer will be my 10th anniversary doing this professionally, actually making money doing it. And in that time period, I shipped uh, a few games here and there. Uh, I started with the Jazz Jackrabbit series, which got me out of my mother's house. And then we did Unreal and then Unreal Tournament. And Unreal Tournament has sold over uh, 2.8 million copies worldwide. Unreal sold well over a million. And, uh, you know, we got Unreal Unreal Part 2 coming up, which is a sequel to the first Unreal, as well as Unreal Tournament 2003, which is a sequel to Unreal Tournament. Uh, Unreal Tournament 2003 is being de developed by an external company called Digital Extremes. Uh, Unreal 2 is being developed by a company called Legend Entertainment. So I'm like working with those teams to make sure the games are badass, make sure they're fun, as well as designing my own game and working with our own internal team and selling our technology and maintaining a marriage and a house and a dog. So I, there's just not enough hours in the day, you know. But you still find the time to, you've got a new idea, you're running through the code. Well, you got to understand, my job is, it's, it's just as much about my ideas as it is about the team's ideas. When I, when I design, I, I have my own vision of the game, but I also think the team has their own vision of the game, and it's my job to channel that vision out through them. You know, an artist has an idea about how a character should work. If his idea is great, I'm going to use it. You know, why would I sit there and force my idea, you know, if his idea is better? So, I, you know, I pick and choose from what everybody wants to do with the game, and, you know, I, I kind of filter all that, and I work with the programmers to make sure that that vision is implemented. I listen to what the fans want. I see what they want to play. I, I you know, take everything to heart. And uh, you know we apply that to the next games we make. I love, I love reading websites that trash us. I love jumping in there feet first and you know, talking to the people who hate us and seeing what they hate and why and figuring out why. That's the only way you can improve. Exactly. So you've done AI to for sports announcer stuff in the past, right? I mean that was your immediate previous work right. for visual concepts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did the, yeah, I did the generalized commentary AI that was used for both NFL 2K2 and NBA 2K2. Um, yeah, shared by both systems. Okay, you run you run board gaming and card gaming sessions at your house, right? Right, right. Uh, about twice a month, you know. I mean, I think it's really important to sort of fill the well, you know, and look at lots of games and lots of media, you know, and have have fun because like game games are playful and game design should be a playful process and what do you find do you find um that game designers play ga these games in different ways, or what, what's your data collection or input, the, you know, stimulation that you get from these events? Oh, well, I mean, they're fun to play, but also, I mean, I think there's definitely a deconstruction element where, you know, uh, you know, you look at it much like, you know, a film student or, or something is always, like, looking for the boom hanging in every frame, you know, like, you play the game, you know, you play the game with a certain critical eye that, like, changes your experience, and I don't think I can quantify it anymore than that, you know, or, or describe it any more than that. I think the weirdest people in the industry are probably your friends. So what do you see that's happening in their lives or their work that's a uh, significant change from year to year? Well, the Indie Game Jam was a great experience, and I think that that was, I learned a lot from that. I mean, really what it boils down
boils down to is inspiring new ways for the programmer to sort of take themselves out of the loop. You know, I think, I mean, I think that programmers are sort of seen as like the the geniuses who, you know, you know, that's where the rubber hits the road is the programming, but but in reality, I think the best programmers are trying to sort of like make themselves obsolete in a certain way by creative by creating technologies that let designers, you know, have the full expressive power of the medium and, and of the platform, you know, and, and use it directly and iterate on that and, and not have to go to a not have to go to a, a, a program every time they want a feature change and those kind of things. And uh, a lot of the tool technology, a lot of the database technology uh, is letting them do that. Well, but this is a direct departure then from the roots of gaming where the designer and the programmer and the artist were all one person. Well, I mean, I think that's inevitable. I mean, the games are bigger, the projects are bigger. I mean, it just has to happen. That having been said, you know, understand, you know, having a good uh, programming knowledge is important for game design. Like, like, game design is inherently an algorithmic process and you can't get away from that. So, I mean, designers need to understand the fundamentals of, like, how computers work and how computation works uh, in order for it to... Can we get a rum and coke and a cranberry juice and ginger ale mixed together, please? <laughs> okay. I think the game industry is calcified and is in danger of turning into comic books. In the, same, in the analogy to comic books as an art form have this immense potential. And you get people like Scott McCloud talking about the potential of the art form. But if you go into a store and try and buy a comic book, it's just this completely calcified, like symbolic, you know, thing. And they haven't really. I mean, there's some indie stuff going on there, but it's very hard. Um, and. Uh, Whereas in film, yes, there's a bunch of crap that comes out every summer, but there's still film festivals with a lot of uh, experimental stuff going on. And I'm just, I, I think it's incredibly important for going forward if we're actually going to be around in a healthy industry and artistic medium in you know, 10 years, that we have to start this process. So I figure you know, if I'm not going to do it, nobody's, you know, you got you to do your piece. Yep. So. The Indie Game Jam was, t the idea was to take a, a constrained technology that is game design neutral and have 15 really smart programmers, designers come and try different things with it. Figuring out what you wanted to code, it was almost all of the time was spent on gameplay code, which is not the case in a normal project. I mean, first off, it was four days, so you just could intensely dive in. You didn't care what the code looked like when you were done, so you didn't have to have make it maintainable. You're just like, oh, let me expose this global variable here. I'm going to hack on this thing. I'm going to totally destroy this, the modularity of this thing. But hey, I got my thing done, um, and I was able to uh, um, express my design. It was a good enough engine. It was not a great engine. It was a good enough engine, and the programmers were excellent. And so they were able to take their idea and go, oh, I could do this, and then do it in four days, and you actually had something. Um, um, that was innovative and experimental, and it was just amazing. Is it a vacation for the brain, or? I kind of think of it as like a writer's workshop where um, a bunch of professional writers will go away for a weekend and all collaborate on, I mean, they'll each do individual stories, but they'll all help each other in like this really intense brainstorming session. And um, this was kind of like that. Everyone was helping each other. Um, everyone did individual things, but the collaboration that was happening and the just like intense pressure cooker, like brainstorming creativity thing. Um, so it was really like an advanced graduate thing. You're already a professional. You're already at the top of your field. But you need that peer um, experience that you don't necessarily get if you're at the top of your company. You don't have 15 other people who are just as smart as you to like crunch on something for an entire weekend. And with no like, you don't have to manage anyone. Like there are people there who don't write that much code because they're managers now because they're so high up. And like, um, but they finally they got to write code again. They got to like um, do what they wanted to do quickly without any any consequences. Like, hey, we're just gonna throw the source code up on on in, in, on the on the internet. Like, that's it. You're done. You left. You flew home. Other, other mature media like film and music have a way of bringing experimental work up into the mainstream. So whether it's you know the a and guy from a music label going to a garage band's gig and saying, oh, you guys are going to be the next big thing, or ripping it off and giving it to Britney Spears, but still, the creative flow is there. In the industry, in the game industry, there's not any mechanism for doing that. So this workshop, the Indie Game Jam, the, experiment, the, uh, the Independent Games Festival, all of these are things that are starting to start up um, to hopefully help that churn of ideas from the small indie thing up into to you know the more mainstream stuff because I think you have to have all levels of that to have a, a healthy successful uh, artistic medium um, and games currently are missing this bottom level. Uh, who are you? I'm Heather Kelly. I am a level mission designer at Ion Storm Austin working on Thief 3. I have been working in Quake, Quake 3 engine to create some digital art. It's uh, it's serious eye candy. I'm, I'm uh, not uh, I'm using a lot of the, the assets that are available for people that want to do Quake mods and taking them and making non-representational abstract spaces that
players can run around in. And the players are really, they're more like uh, video, you know, video mixers because you're running around in a space that's not representational. It has physical uh, properties. It has gravity and you're doing all the things you would do in a regular quake uh, level. But it's not representing a, a, a prototypical quake environment. It's not a castle. It, it's not, you know, a spaceship or anything like that. It's really just using the the really powerful graphic properties of the Quake engine to create visual effects, and therefore the player that w runs through them is is creating on the fly this this video installation, this piece that they can you know display on a screen. So that's how I've been showing it is in uh, video video environments in a public space where people that are at the event can come interact with it. Now that you made this visual thing, it's, a, it's essentially a, an aesthetic product or piece of thing. Does it inspire any gameplay ideas? Do you think, wow, now you could take this idea where you're running through lightning and water and swimming through lightning? I mean, what could you do with that that you think might be a game? Or do you think it's better off as a kind of mental construct for game environments? Well, it does. I, I like to play with the tools and twist them into things that they aren't supposed to do as a technique to find out new possible gameplay ideas for, for actual publishable games. Uh, I haven't, I can't say that I've taken something from that particular experiment that I did yet and worked it into what I'm working on professionally, but it's always there. I mean, it, it's what, it's something to just sort of drive the creative thought to, to do something, to use what, to use the tools you have at hand as any designer c can, even if whether it's designing a physical board game like we were doing earlier in the design workshop, whatever you have in front of you tends to be more easily integrated than just something you come up with out of your head. So you want to have a lot of tools on hand to play with. And so that was really what it was for me, it was a set of tools to do interesting things with. I'll do something in design and then probably realize afterwards that it was, it was much, very much influenced by something I'd done in a thought experiment. Do you have side projects you're working on? Oh, uh, I can give you a quick demo. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> this is the latest in uh, uh, virtual uh, user um, interfaces. And uh, you t type this one, this, this uh, taps off the ashes. And you can stub it out with this one, and then you can light it back up with this. And then you can you dial in, you know, the quality and your attitude and your capacity and your tolerance. And then basically here. And then it makes a joint. So, <laughs> so this we're gonna do another one. The government's gonna pay for the one um, for it's gonna be a stop smoking tutorial. And it'll tell you when you can have a patch. So it'll have a little alarm, it'll vibrate, nee, 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 time for a nicotine patch. Oh, cool! I get one. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to get the government to pay for this one. So, anyway. <laughs>